Uh, welcome to Bible study in Scarborough Street on Wednesday the 24th of June. Friends, we continue our studies in the book of Revelation. We reach chapter 7 tonight. It's in the middle of scene 2, the second of eight scenes in this book of Revelation. And this scene deals with a scroll with seven seals on it. And we learnt that Jesus is the only one who could open each of the seals and the scroll speaking of the history that God has created and permitted God who is in control of all things. And as we come to um, this seventh chapter in the middle of this scene, we've looked at six uh, seals being opened and uh, tried to understand their meaning. But before we come to the seventh seal, which is simply just opened, and we'll find out why it's simply opened and uh, there's nothing observed about that seal at the moment. But we come to this chapter seven, which is, is a wonderful chapter, a glorious uh, affirmation of God's promise throughout the scriptures that he will keep his people safe. Revelation is a book, in the very first chapter, we are promised that whoever reads it will be blessed. So that's from John's readers right down through the centuries to today. And there's no blessing without understanding. And I trust that as we've looked through the first six chapters, we've seen how Revelation applies to every age and rather than being concerned about speculation we're concerned about truth and what God is revealing pictorially about his gospel so let's come to God in prayer father we bless you for the the wonder of your truth we bless you for this book in the scriptures and we ask, O oh God, that you will help us as we come to chapter 7 in Revelation uh, to see something of your grand plan being unfolded in these pictures. And we bless you for that promise that your children are ever secure. And so, Lord, may we be strengthened in faith and may we be encouraged in life. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Friends, we'll read from chapter 7 in Revelation and then look to break it up, asking a number of, of necessary questions. We hear God's word, Revelation chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the numbers of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all of the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. 
They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God and to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God. And serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. Friends, as we come to Revelation chapter 7, we come to a number of necessary questions that we need to ask. The last study, chapter 6, we saw uh, six seals. Uh, And each of those seals being opened. But here before we come to the the seventh seal. We have this chapter in the middle. And we need to ask questions. And look for answers. So the plan is to ask three questions. When. Who. And why. And in the answering of those questions. We're ready to move on to the seventh seal. The first question is simply this, the sealing. When uh, the sealing of of history and, and these seals being opened, revealing what God is doing. We ask the question, when is this particular sealing that we find in, in chapter seven? The sealing of the 144,000 and and asking questions about what this number means. In verse 7, or sorry, verse 1 of chapter 7, we read, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Now it's dangerous to assume, as we have already seen in our studies in Revelation, that when we come to a phrase like after this, it doesn't necessarily mean that once what we have just seen happens, then something else will take place. Apocalyptic writing is not necessarily sequenced writing, as we might find in a narrative. It's of a different nature. Here, for example... In chapter 6, the previous chapter, the earth had been harmed. Each of the four riders brought destruction upon the earth. But now we read in chapter 7, verse 3, do not harm the earth. And of course, seal 6 in the last chapter speaks of when Christ will come again. And after that, there will be a, after the second coming, there will be no more harming because the old earth and heavens will have passed away and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. So there's nothing left to harm. And so when we speak about after this, we have to be careful. Revelation is given in pictures. 
And I think if we can imagine it like this, it will maybe help us. You go into a gallery. You're looking at different paintings on the walls. You come to one quite involved painting with different characters. And there's a depth within that painting. And your eyes are drawn to a certain scene. And then as you look at that, your eyes move past this most perhaps dominating scene and you see other things behind in a distance. It's the same painting, but you're noticing different things within that same painting. Here in chapter 7, we have the same painting, as it were. But we have a deeper sense of perception when we come into chapter 7. Our eyes are directed to something else that's there. It's the same scene. And you might be looking at something and they say, oh, look. You've seen something else, but it's the same picture. Here, John is enabled to see something closer to God in this scene. Having seen four horsemen harming the earth, he now perceives four winds. Uh, Each has the power also to harm the earth. But these four winds are controlled by four angels of God. It is a new angle of the scene started at the beginning of chapter 6. In your Bibles, if you turn back to Zechariah chapter 6 at verse 1, we'll find... uh, Something here with with, with a parallel to what we find in chapter 7 in Revelation. Zechariah 6 and verses 1 to 5. I looked up again, and there before me were four chariots coming out from heaven between two mountains, mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black the third white, the fourth dappled, all of them powerful. I asked the angel who was speaking to me, what are these, my Lord? The angel answered me, these are the four spirits of heaven going out from standing in the presence of the Lord of the whole world. So when we come to a book like Revelation, Back in the Old Testament, there are a number of books. Daniel is one, um, Zechariah is another, where there are apocalyptic writings there also. Here we see four horse-drawn chariots linked with the four winds of God. But the revealed truth here is that God is in control of the horsemen, Coming into Revelation 7, it is God who is in control. And he will ensure that the church, his people, is sealed and secure before any destruction occurs. Now do you see what God is wonderfully teaching us? The horsemen will ride out with destruction, chapter 6. But before that, God is holding back a very special protection and that protection is uh, is holding back to give that very special protection to his people. Denoted here with the angels holding back this picture of four winds which can also bring a description a parallel to the destruction a parallel to the four horses bringing destruction upon the world so God's people are going to be protected and they're protected because they are sealed in 
in Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 1 to 4. This is just the, the second of two looks we have at the Old Testament. Ezekiel uh, chapter 9, verses 1 to 4. Probably something that you have read uh, in the past, but have maybe not noticed uh, something very peculiar here. We hear a lot in today's world about um, uh, numbers and signs and ceilings on, on foreheads or wrists and uh, a lot can be made in speculation about what this can mean. These are symbolic things and we find this in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 9 at verse 1. Then I heard him call out in a loud voice. Bring the guards of the city here, each with a weapon in his hand. And I saw six men coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. With them was a man clothed in linen, who had a writing kit at his side. They came in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the Lord, the God of Israel, went up from above the cherubim where it had been and moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing kit at his side and said to him, Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. Just ending there at verse 4. Here we read in Ezekiel about a mark on the forehead. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. And you can read uh, this passage uh, 1 verse 13 on to 15. About that marking, that sealing of the spirit upon the believer. So when we come to the scriptures about a mark on the forehead or on a ceiling or whatever it is, it's speaking of what God is doing for his people. It's not a literal thing. It's not a physical thing. It's denoting a spiritual reality. If someone has become a Christian, they have that mark of God on them. It's not something that can be seen, not something detected with infrared light or anything else. It's a symbol given to us in Scripture, denoting that God knows who are his. And he holds them dearly and solidly. No one will take a believer out of the hand of God. So the ultimate safety is guaranteed. When someone comes to faith in Christ, they are ever secure. And the ceiling here in chapter 7 denotes this. The second question, the ceiling who? In verses 4 to 12 in this chapter. And we do ask questions. Who are the 144,000? Of verse 4. Who is in the innumerable crowd in verse 9? It's less of a puzzle than we might first think. Verse 3 tells us something very plainly Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees. Until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. And then these servants are numbered. The picturing here is 12 tribes and 12,000 in each tribe as we read. That speaks of all of God's people. Because who ultimately will be in heaven? who ultimately will be eternally secure. It is every one of God's children. 
We have already seen how uh, the Old Testament uh, prophets and, and the tribes and then the New Testament uh, apostles, the church of the Old and New Testament, how they, they come together to form the whole people of God. And that's exactly what we have here. All the Old and New Testament believers alike. And if we are servants of God, then we too are sealed. We too are included in this symbolic number of completion. They're described as 144,000 Israelites. Well, of course, the plain truth of Scripture is that if we belong to Christ, we are sealed. And if we are sealed, then we belong to all of God's people. And if we are told that this number is 144,000 and we know there are millions throughout the generations who have come to true faith in Christ, what does that tell us? It tells us that this number is clearly symbolical and not literal. It speaks of all God's people. The church is made up mainly of Gentiles. So how can this number of sealed people be defined as from the 12 tribes of Israel? Well, of course, the New Testament teaches that true Jews looked forward to Christ. And those who are Jews or Gentiles after him, who look back to him, they are the true Israel of God. Jews and Gentiles together, the dividing wall broken down in Ephesians chapter 2. All of God's people, Old and New Testament together, make up the new Israel. A true Jew is not simply a Jew by circumcision, but one of the heart. We read of that in Romans chapter 2. And the New Testament is full of scriptures that speak of being spiritual Jews. An Old Testament Jew may be a spiritual Jew. A New Testament Jew or Gentile may be a spiritual Jew through faith in the same Jesus Christ. And this speaks of all of God's people. Galatians 3 verse 29, the Christian is called one who possesses, who is in possession, being a spiritual seed of Israel. Oh, sorry, a spiritual seed of Abraham. Abraham is our father, just as Abraham was the father of the true Jew in the Old Testament. And what of this innumerable crowd in verse 9? Answer, one and the same as the 144,000. John heard a voice from heaven. It was God's voice. And in that voice, God revealed his children. And he used symbolism to do that. 144,000. Or this innumerable crowd. Too many for us to count. But not for God. Friends, we come to the third question regarding to the ceiling that we find in chapter 7. And that's in verses 17, 13 to 17. And it asks the question, why? Why were these people sealed? The representative elder asks for and gives an answer to those who are in white robes. We read that in verses 14 and 15. These are they who have come out of the, tribula the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. So what do the white robes mean? Does it mean those who have died or suffered for their faith, those who were persecuted? 
in some great happening yet to be? Some great tribulation uh, in the future? We read verse 14 that they have come out. So it's something that is past intense certainly in this vision. Simply put, it means the servants of God of every age. Far from complicating things, God makes this very clear to us. Who are these people? See, the danger is to focus on a phrase like great tribulation and assume that great tribulation means something yet to come. We haven't come through a great tribulation yet, but it will come. And, and if that's how we look at this, then we will be looking for something future. And then that will direct our thinking into those who have been particularly brave. You know, those who have come through it. Those who have been steadfast. Those who have suffered greatly. Those who have been martyred for the faith. They have come through this great tribulation. But the text doesn't tell us that. It doesn't focus on the individual. It doesn't focus on what the individual has done or endured. It focuses on something else. Let's read it again. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They have washed their robes. They're white in the blood of the Lamb. It's the Lamb who makes their robes white. This speaks of Jesus' sacrifice. It speaks of the cross. It speaks of the victory for all believers. And those who come out of the great tribulation, each believer has his or her robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. The focus is on Jesus, not on the individual. The focus is on the cross, not on what, what anyone may endure or the cost that anyone may pay. The focus is all on Jesus. And so the glory goes to him. They aren't white because of something special they have done. Or something great they have endured. It's all because of Jesus. Every Christian is washed in his blood. And here. This simple little passage speaks of all the servants of God. They have a new life. And no tribulation can quench it. Any time any place, any generation. God's people are safe and secure. After these three questions about the sealing, we come to the seventh seal in chapter 8 at verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. I'm sure in reading that verse, we naturally puzzle. Something is opened and we just have silence. Nothing relayed to us. In that time. Now seal six. As we know from last week's study. Covered the end of history. 
And though we have to be careful about sequencing in the book of Revelation, seal seven, the seal that follows, is concerned with what happens after history. Now, why is that so? Well, the answer is fairly simple. When seal seven is broken, there is a silence which confirms the interpretation of this whole scene number two. As we have seen, seen um, two, Jesus is revealing to John what the experience of the church will be. The church on earth will suffer in every generation. But God has his sealing upon his own people. And they are eternally protected. And God will bring every Christian through each generation into their heavenly home because they have been washed in the blood of the Lamb and they are eternally secure. God gives us this word, not that we might speculate in fear, but that we might rejoice in certainty. No matter what comes, God will hold his people because Jesus has died for them. Scene two is a wonderful scene. Now God is going to reveal to John what will happen after the end of time. What will happen after seal six at the end of the world. And so he's introduced to that end in the opening of the seventh seal. The seventh seal speaks of another world to come. But these are things that will be left to later passages in the book of Revelation. And so begins an hour and a half of silence. It's not long in terms of history and eternity. But in terms of this drama, it is a lengthy interval. John is to think about what he has seen in scene two. Christ the Lord of history. Christ in control of everything in history. God standing behind even all the evil that is inflicted upon this world, he doesn't create it, he doesn't endorse it, but he keeps it in check because he is sovereign. And in the midst of all evil, he seals his people. They are washed in the blood of the Lamb. They are ever secure. And John is to spend time thinking on these things before moving on to what else God would reveal to him. And that's what we should do before we come next week and look in to another scene, scene three. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that scripture reveals scripture, scripture interprets scripture. We thank you that as we come to a book like Revelation with its signs and pictures, images and numbers, that we don't go about speculating what this or that may mean or signify. But we rather want to look and see what you reveal and see how you declare the truth in these pictures. We thank you for this scene because 
we who live on earth see much of the wickedness in this earth. We see much of the riders riding out, bringing destruction. But we bless you that it is Christ alone who can open the seal. He alone has authority in history. All other authority is passing. And he one day will quell and quench all evil. And Lord, we bless you for this wonderful picture of the sealing of your people. You keep them safe. All of your people. Every servant of Jesus. In every generation. Each one sealed. Because they have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And no tribulation will keep them from their home in heaven. And so, Lord, as we come to the end of this second scene, help us to do what you instructed John to do, just to sit and reflect, to reflect on what we have seen, and heard to rejoice in the Christ who controls history to rejoice in the Christ who shed his blood for his people to rejoice in the Christ who will be honored when this world is passed away and the new heavens and the new earth are created for he will present every servant of God before the throne because their robes are washed in the blood of the Lamb. And your church will be complete and your church secure in heaven is equally secure on earth for such is your promise. Hear our prayer and accept our thanks for Jesus' sake. Amen. Friends, thanks for being with us tonight and look forward to your company next week as we move in to chapter 8.